There are very few instances in life where you meet someone who you find just deeply fascinating on every level. And for me, Dr. Jordan Schlein was most certainly one of these people. Jordan is what we know as the father of concierge medicine, which is really the cornerstone of preventative care in the U.S., And he built his doctor's practices, which are based in Malibu, I believe, on the principles of five-star concierge service. And what I absolutely love is that Jordan has pushed the envelope on so many traditional constructs that people take for granted, like, for example, doctor's visits being A, reactionary, but B, not particularly good service. And in this conversation, we speak about absolutely everything from what, what we believe to be the, the core of reality right through to Jordan's experience and how he grew what today is now private medical. So without further ado, Jordan, a huge welcome to the podcast. First of all, big welcome. And I think you are really one of my favorite people that I've ever met. And the fact that oh, you wow. pitched up with, I, that's a high praise. No, that's very high expectations praise. Expectations are high going into this. I don't take that lightly. <laughs> well, good. I'm glad. And, and that the hat that you've pitched up on, if for anyone who's watching um, on video, you are wearing an absolutely glorious, what is that, a sailor's hat? It is a it is a captain's hat, but it's got the captain's San Francisco Cap- logo in of, it. Um, yes. Captain of Tulum today. Yeah, I'm captain of my destiny, I think. I try to be. Amazing. And I think just going back to when we met, we we met at a dinner in Vegas, very serendipitously. And I and I very distinctly remember A, you had some of the most interesting and sort of I would I would say controversial questions at the dinner, which I always enjoy. You had um some of the most insightful book recommendations, which I've subsequently read. Okay. And very interesting uh, sort of things to say on life. So I think where I'd really love to start is I want to hear more about you and sort of let's get into who is Jordan Schlein and sort of how on earth did you end up uh, doing what you're doing and interested in what you're interested in? So I, uh, people say, where do you, where are you from? And my, my, you know, everybody usually knee jerks to where they were born or where they live which is a, a spatial phenomenon, um, a geographical phenomenon. I like to talk about the temporal ph- phenomenon. So I like to say I come from the future. Um, nice. <laughs> partially, be- <laughs> partially because it's a fun place to go to um, if you can in your mind um, and then try to come back to the present. So I, I, I feel like I've, in a way I've been here before because I, I like to time travel in my own head. It's called auto noetic consciousness. It's, a, it's actually a way to time travel in your own head. Now people think I'm crazy, but I'm not. Um, so I'm born and raised in San Francisco, California. And my father was a surgeon. So I grew up with, uh, with a, a father that said, son, you can be whatever you want when you grow up as long as you're a doctor. So his, his attitude was like, you know, doctors are problem solvers. That's all we are. Uh, we have to see a problem and solve it. So very kind of transactional f- fix it. You know, it's broken, fix it. Uh, my mother, um, when I was in middle school and high school, uh, went back to school and got her PhD in clinical psychology and wanted to understand human psychology and relationships when very few people understand themselves, uh, let alone anybody else. But we all think we do. So I had these two kind of twin influences, both healers, one, you know, quick fix it. And the other one, let's sit down and really unpack it and understand it in great detail through the lens of psychology. And, you know, when I went to medical school, um, well, actually, right before I went to medical school, I was at my graduation party at UC Berkeley, uh, where I studied both physiology and philosophy. And um, I was talking with uh, this woman at a, at a bar, kind of like a restaurant where I met you. So I was sitting at this bar with this woman, and she said, so you're going to med school? I said, I am. And she said, well, what did you do for your first summer in college? I said, well, I took organic chemistry. And she said, what did you do for your second summer in college? I said, I took biochemistry. And and she said, what did you do for your third summer in college? I said, I studied for the medical school application test. She goes, so you didn't have any summers for four years. I said, yeah. She said, and now you're going to go to med school. You're not going to have any summers for the rest of your life. Don't you think you need to take some time off? And I looked at her and I'm like, wow, that maybe that's the right question. 
Like maybe that's the question that I haven't asked myself. Maybe, maybe I try to answer that question. So she wrote a phone number down on a piece of paper. This is 1990, 1989, no cell phone, no internet. I woke up the next morning, saw a phone number in my pocket with a Boston um, zip code and area code. And I called it and it was Harvard. <laughs> and they said, this is world teach where would, you know, you would like to apply to teach somewhere in the world. And I didn't, she didn't tell me what the number was. She just said, call this number. Wow. And, and I was like, um, well, and they said, by the way, the deadline for applications today, and we have enough English teachers. I said, well, I could teach science. You know, I, I was a, you know, I got a 4.0 Berkeley teach, you know, in, in physiology and science and biology. And they said, oh, we, we need science teachers. And the next thing you know, um, I got accepted to that program. My medical school deferred my application for the next year. And I wound up teaching high school in Kenya in a remote village in Western Kenya, near Lake Victoria, near Kisumu, which is near the town that Obama's father was born, but nobody knew Obama back then. And I was teaching chemistry, physics, and biology in Swahili. Uh, so I took a, a six week wow. intensive Swahili class. Anyway, my life just went upside down, no electricity, no running water, no vehicles. They'd never seen a white person before. And it was one of those things where I went to Kenya to make a, to, to change, to make a, a change in the world. And I, you know, came back and realized that, 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 that experience changed me like whole cloth came back a different person mm. um, and then went to medical school. And yeah. You know, and then that's kind of my, that's how my journey, <laughs> you said, where, where did I come from? How did I get here? Like, <laughs> those elements kind of like kickstarted the, the whole thing to get me on this journey where then I went to medical school and like, I had a, a life experience of living amongst people that had nothing, nothing. And infant mortality rate was super high. Like each husband, each, each, each man had like eight wives. Each wife had eight kids because a couple of them wouldn't make it and they had a farm to attend to. And like, but they were happy people. Like they, they made the best, uh, you know, and like in Western society, you'd say, oh my God, that's horrible. But it's just, just different lens upon which to look through culture and life. And so I've always taken this approach of, I've got to like zoom way out when looking at anything. And, and I have to look at it from different perspectives before I can make a judgment uh, on what it is. And most of us yeah. just snap to, I see it, you know, we're so visual, we see something, therefore it's true. But I remember there was one time, just a brief story when I was in Africa and I, I bought a motorcycle because I needed to like, feel like I could move around. And I drove down to Lake Victoria one day and I saw these fishermen, uh, like, I don't know, a couple hundred meters away. And they looked like they were untangling this big fishing net on a little boat, not a motor, like a canoe type of thing. And I, I was just sitting there on this bluff, looking down at these two characters and I, in a hot baking sun and they were shirtless and wearing shorts. And I thought, what a, what a struggle their life must be. And then I thought, and, th and then I thought, well, what if I'm wrong? So I, I took my motorcycle and I got like a hundred meters closer to them. And I kind of went to the left and I could look from the side and I realized that their net wasn't tangled. Like I thought it was when I was 200 yards out, but it was neatly organized. And from a distance, it looked like they were untangling a thing, but they were actually folding it into a nice orderly thing. Um, and, and I thought to myself, wow, I just, totally misread that from over there. Let me get closer and see if I can read something else. So then I got really kind of up close to them, like maybe 10 meters away. And I realized they were laughing and having a good time. And, and they, you know, you could kind of, I could hear a little bit, they were telling jokes. And, and then I realized, wow, it, like depending on where you are and, and how open your mind is to what you're seeing, like it's different from every perspective. And so I think, you know, who I am is I'm, I'm constantly trying to get out of my own way to understand what's in front of me. I question everything, um, which drives people crazy um, when they meet me. But I think it helps get to the <laughs> but I think it helps get to a, a, a more clear understanding of what if there's a problem to solve, what are the questions to answer to get to the solution as quickly as possible um, and with the least resistance in the circuit and. Anyway, that was a long, fascinating, <laughs> that was a long, that, no, answer. no, that is, I think that's, I, I, they're jeepers. This is why we spoke so much the first time we saw, we met. I'm really interested. You, you spoke about your parents having kind of these two sort of different ways of viewing the world, one kind of quite quick fix and, and what have you, and one sort of more on the, the, the questioning and asking the why and trying to sit with problems. How much do you think, and just because we're in the space of, and I'm in the, the interest of how much do you think parents shape children sort of as a general question, but for you specifically, how did that influence kind of the way you navigate the world? And, and do you think having those sort of two very different kind of role models, how did that play out? So it's interesting. 
I, I think a lot of people put a lot of emphasis on genetics and environment, and those are very true also. But in general, uh, we model ourselves after what we know, what our culture is, what our environment is, what how people respond to things. And I was just talking last night with somebody about how when you look at children of alcoholic parents, the, the rate of their alcoholism is very high. And people say, well, it's genetic. And, you know, and well, is it, or I mean, did, is that an epigenetic phenomena where mm. the alcohol caused that gene to change and then it got passed? And, and then you look at kids of abused parents and then they go on to abuse more frequently. So I think that there's a huge influence that, that parents have on their kids and, and in modern culture with the internet and, and social media and, and like at, at a later age, it becomes much more challenging to, to know what your kids are even doing. Uh, it used to be like when I was a kid, you know, pre-internet and I don't want to be like, I remember when I was old and I had to walk through the snow, you know, but you know, you, you would go out and play with your friends or you would, mm do something else, but th th there was not a lot of options. You played with your friends, you played with your siblings, or you practiced guitar, did something, you know, whatever. You read, and now you can um, be sitting with a little piece of plastic and metal and, um, and, and, and be interacting with a zillion things that are either beneficial or non-beneficial, but, but ultimately that's why I think like screen time and all these functions of like, you know, you can't let your kids just go rogue at a young age, um, partially just because they, they're, they're in the mode of setting boundaries and, and for themselves or understanding boundaries, I guess I should say. And if there are no boundaries that the, you know, it's a wild west, at a young age, it, I just think it portends a, a challenging future for, to navigate the world because everything's possible and, and everything is possible, but not everything should be possible, you know, at, mm -hmm. at a young age. I think there needs to be some, some boundaries that what well, we, I think any person would say boundaries are good. Um, yeah. So I think good parenting and good modeling uh, as, as a, as a parent is critical. And if you're distracted, you can't tell your kids not to be. Um, and, yeah. and if you're not present, you know, and I was just talking with a friend of mine who studies attention, um, a neuroscientist at Stanford. I, um, and I did a podcast with him, so we can talk about that, you know, how to, for people to listen to that one if they want. But, you know, an attention comes in like two and a half second increments. The human brain processes attention in like two and a half seconds. And so, which is interesting, right? And so that's why movies, if you look at old movies, they used to be long dialogues, back and forth, driving in the car, until they understood, once they understood that attention was two and a half seconds, is that you could hack the cognition function of attention by making scenes that lasted two and a half seconds and all these jump shots now. They're all moving every, uh, even when people are dialoguing, it's this person, then it's that person. It's this person. Then it's not like one person talking for longer than two and a half seconds. So, so like, as, as we understand neuroscience better and, and as, as, you know, kind of people want more brain, you know, what do they call it? The attention economy. Yeah. Um, they will, in fact, you know, sadly leverage that neuroscience and, and, make people distractible so that, you know, and there's a big case for boredom is a positive influence in your life. Completely. And so to be bored is when you have to get, was when you got kind of get creative and you yeah. introspect. And so, you know, we've, you know, a lot of parents have outsourced parenting to the iPhone and the iPad and the cartoons and the TV and the, you know, versus like being present. And, you know, as you likely know, there's a lot of uh, pheromones and oxytocin and bonding that happens when there's just two people together. Um, you know, whether they're bored or they're just holding hands or th they're doing nothing, but if two people together is, you know, really one of these fundamental units of, of life that, you know, we feed off of, I call it cognitive nutrition because ultimately in the three dimensional structure of your body, you know, which weighs this much and we can measure it in all different ways. It's, it's ultimately alone. It, you know, mm. and only when you're with somebody talking, even like you and I are, so we're not alone. Now, obviously, we're thousands of miles away, but we're together. Um, if yeah. I was holding your, if I was holding your hand, like now we're physically touching. Now your physical structure and my physical structure, this thing that generally doesn't touch things, other people very often, it makes mm. us less alone. You know, and that's why I think kissing and, and and intimacy and all these other forms, like then you're like really, you know, 
enmeshed with somebody else and it 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 just decreases the existential angst i think that we all have about like what we're doing in the world but yeah you know may not Which, be exactly what you asked but um but no I do, well i mean i i'm just gonna say i'm not gonna ask about the existential angst because then that's a whole podcast <laughs> in and of itself right there yeah what do you think the effects are though with with children kind of being more entertained by screens and less physical contact with parents, less one-on-one -on -one time with parents. What do you think those effects are? And have you seen any uh, sort of tangible, tangible outcomes already? I, th I think that story is yet to fully be written because there are digital natives being born right now with TikTok and Snapchat. I mean, they have a center for internet disorders at Harvard, right? Wow. So there's actually a place for parents that have kids that now one could argue, well, were those kids going to have a disorder of something else? And they just latched onto the technology as the manifestation of that disorder. Um, but that's a question he's trying to answer. Um, so he's got funding from a lot of tech companies that, you know, may or may not like the results of his studies. But I think in the spirit of actually knowing what causes harm, um, we, we need to do that research. I mean, we unleashed this beast without thinking about what are the guardrails and like only, you know, until they put screen time on, which came much later, did we realize like, well, wow, this can be, you know, the humans, like they, they like to see the little three dots that someone's texting them back, like they're waiting. So, you know, are humans evolving, you know, and, and by the way, like my son can listen to a book at three X the speed on a, on his, you know, thing. And I'm just like, what? You, can mm. you hear that? Like, there's no way I can even oh, understand it. So I think their brains actually are processed. Their processing power is a little faster than ours uh, or the older generations because they're just exposed to more and the brain is so plastic and, and so novel that it will uh, adapt. So, you know, are we, are we seeing like some evolution from homo sapien to homo? I mean, there's a bunch of other um, people coming up with terms that like we're, you know, we're evolving and for the conservatives out there that think, well, we should just stay right where we are. Like, well, what if we were the homo habilis and we decided that then like we're always evolving. We mm. can't stop it. It's, it's part of, it's part of entropy and enthalpy and physics and science. And we'll always be moving on to evolve. And we, I think we have to embrace it, but we have to look critically at like how it fundamentally affects with, with research. And I, and I think that there's a lot of people spouting a bunch of crap that they saw like, oh, my kid did this. So therefore it's true. And, and you know, in the hierarchy of scientific evidence where you have meta-analysis and randomized placebo controlled trials and all the way down to like case studies and opinion papers is most people don't know what's what. And so if any mm. person says something, you know, that they read a scientific paper, like I read a lot of scientific papers and a lot of them are garbage. They have confounding yeah. variables. There's biases. There's conflicts of interest. No one actually does the work. So I'm hoping that ChatGPT and a couple other factors out there will start to like much, you know, rather than ask Google something, you'll ask ChatGPT, like, what is the strength of the science of this argument? And, and then you can calibrate how to understand something better uh, than just, you know, I heard some podcasting guru say something and therefore it's true. Completely. Completely. And I think we're starting to already see it. it's almost like a shift back to nuance where I think it's often been, especially in the last couple of years, everything is fear based and whether it's don't only feed your children organic food or, you know, don't put chemicals on your face. There's pieces of that that's true. And then there's pieces of that that's just scientifically incorrect. Everything is chemicals if you break it down. And so I think the the sort of the, the fear mongering has taken over the actual science and it is, I think it's very difficult for the average consumer to be able to understand what the heck to believe. And I think especially kind of where we sit in the sort of parenting realm, again, there's just, there's so many loud voices and very uh, sort of contrasting opinions and very polarizing opinions. And I think there's, parents don't know where to turn. And so I'm interested to know, because I mean, private, private medical, uh, first of all, maybe let's start there. I'd love you to kind of unpack w what is it, how does it operate, and how did you come up with this sort of fairly groundbreaking kind of idea of how to treat health? So I worked for this older doctor who was going to um, retire in a year and turn over his practice to me, which is in downtown San Francisco. So that doctor who, after I worked with him for a year, was supposed to um, retire and turn over his practice and the staff and the lease. And I was going to like have this really cool practice in downtown San Francisco. And at the end of the year, he said, you know, I really like this arrangement where I'm paying you like much less than, you know, if this was yours, you know, and you're working 24 seven and you know, you're covering all my patients so I can take vacations with my wife. He said, let's do this for another year and I'll, and I'll pay you a little bit more. And I, I'm like, yo, dude, uh, 
I, I just spent another year as an indentured servant in this model and it's time for you to retire. He's the one I'm not going to. So rather than negotiate with him and try to like negotiate a better term, I, I gave him the middle finger, grabbed my bag and walked out the door. Um, because yeah. I, my philosophy is like, if you are not a, a person of your word, um, then like, I, I can't negotiate. Like I'm, I'm out. I'd, I'd rather not mm -hmm. deal with people like that. So I walked down the street having a little bit of an existential crisis trying to figure out what to do. And I walked into the lobby of a Mandarin Oriental hotel. I didn't know what one of those things was at the time. And I ordered a tea and I sat down and I was like, shit, what am I going to do with my life? And then I looked around and I realized I was in this fancy place. So I walked up to the concierge desk, you know, and I said, excuse me, who, who's the doctor you guys call if somebody gets sick here? And she said, who are you? And I said, well, I could be the doctor you call when somebody gets sick here. And she <laughs> said, she said, you're a doctor. And I said, I am. And she said, and I looked like I was like 12. And, and she said, look, this is a five-star hotel and everything we do here is five-star service. She said, I'm just a concierge. So I'm three-star smart, maybe. She said, but what I do is five-star service, you know, trained by the clay door and these, this whole group of hospitality people. She said, if you're a doctor, then you're five-star smart but you guys do one star service. Oof, if you yeah. want to be the doctor to my guests, you need to learn five star service. I looked at her and I said, teach me like, I, I, you know, I don't yeah. know what that means and uh, how hard can it be? And so fast forward, um, I became the doctor at the Mandarin Oriental hotel and I learned underneath this woman, five star service. And what, what really, what it is, is it's listening, it's following up, it's following through. It's like not, not appearing in a, being a rush, not focusing on efficiency, but focusing on quality. And what I realized in, in doing like house calls to, um, to people in their room is like, it was in their environment. So when you come to a doctor's office, not feeling well, well, first of all, you're not feeling well. Second of all, you're anxious. What's the doctor going to mm -hmm. tell me? Am I going to die? Do I have cancers? Do I need surgery? So there's, it's anxiety everywhere. But when you show up in someone's room and they're in their own bed, at least a hotel bed anyway, um, like they didn't have to go anywhere. So the anxiety goes down by 50%. And then, you know, if you bring in the hospitality quotient, their anxiety goes down to like another 50, 40%. And now you're just there. They're just there. They feel like I'm with a truck because the hotel obviously is going to not let some untrusted character show up in someone's room. Yeah. Like there's all sorts yeah. of risk in that. Um, so I had to be credentialed by the hotel and all this stuff. And, and so I think these guests, like, and whoever they were movie stars or presidents of countries, I've seen prime ministers and like, th they were just people who were mm. in a pinch and they needed help. Mm. And I came there un unimpressed by who they were. And in fact, most of the time I didn't know who they were. They were just like a human in distress that with a problem that I, you know, go back to my dad that I had to solve I had a problem to solve. And, um, and so I had a doctor bag. And so I started taking care of people at the Mandarin and, <clears throat> And then the next thing you know, I went to the, these other hotels and I built this relatively thriving, you know, uh, business. It was called San Francisco on call medical group. And uh, everybody's like, who is this? What are you doing? I'm like, well, I'm just taking care of people and they're paying me for it versus going through the mm -hmm. insurance model. And people would say, well, if you don't take insurance, then you must be doing something dodgy. I'm like, Hey, before insurance, people used to pay doctors just be, I mean, yeah. just because you take insurance. So like people have a hard time going back in time and seeing what worked and saying that that little thing that back then that's now changed there's something in it i mean i think hegel talks about this a lot the the uh the, the philosophers like if you go back in time and find 200 years ago to some way that they found something that worked go find that thing and see if it applies today because the thing might be a universal thing even though it's temporally disjointed from like 100 years or 200 years ago so um so, so that's where I kind of cut my teeth on building a medical system on top of a hospitality system. That's and I think that is the fundamental kind of raison d'etre of like our practice today. Then the internet crashed. September 11th happened. Nobody traveled. Hotels were empty. My business went from like a $3 million a year business to zero overnight. I had to like mm. reinvent myself. And I was like, holy shit, now what am I going to do? And that's when my pediatric partner who started this with me, we just said, well, let's start a membership based model with people who live here instead of people who try. So like, I don't want to be at the whims of like September 11th and, 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 you know, and hotel room vacancies and other things and economy. So let's just, so we started this, you know, what's now called concierge medicine. And what's funny is I learned it from a concierge. 
Um, so we built that model where we would take care of families. Um, we'd make house calls, but they could come to our office. But I really, you know, I spent the last 20 years trying to like crack the code on how do you make people. So right now people want to go to the Apple store. They don't want to go to the doctor store as a concept. How do yeah. you make people want to go to the doctor store? How do you make that part of something that becomes part of people's lives as a, as a place of inspiration, as a place of, as a place of un- learning and education and, 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 and dialogue, unrushed, un- unhurried, um, you know, but nuanced to your point. Um, mm. And so, so that's what I spent the last 20 years building. And what's interesting is about six or seven years ago, the woman from that concierge desk that I met that fateful day in 1998 called me up because we had stayed friends. She said, oh, the, the Mandarin just got bought by the Lowe's and we're going to be a four-star hotel. And she started crying on the phone and she goes, I am not a four-star girl. And you know that. I said, come work for me and build, build out my five-star service program for my practice. And at the time I had three offices. Now we have six. Um, and she's like, in, you know, she, she does training on everybody who works here. It's like, what is hospitality? Cause all these, you know, doctors or nurses or, you know, no one's, no one's trained in how some people are innately hospitable and they just have it in their bones. But a lot of people like it, it's, you know, it, it, you don't do anything over the top. I think it's just becoming very human and, and becoming mm. very attentive, going back to paying attention. Um, yeah. and you know, but I tell people that like, we're, we don't really do concierge medicine. And, and I say that loosely because when you go to a concierge desk, they pretty much say yes to everything. They'll try. And in medicine, people come to me and they ask me stuff and I say no to a lot of things. Like they may say what they want, but I'll tell them what they need. Because oftentimes yeah. what you want, because you heard it on a podcast or your friend's doing it, or you think it's a good idea, the scientific evidence might not be there and you may be causing harm to self. So we've Rick, really gone on this. I've gone on this exploration now where I've helped thousands, hundreds, maybe not thousands, but probably close to a thousand doctors who said, I want to leave this kind of corrupt, perverse incentives insurance model different. I mean, mm-hmm. probably different around the country, but a lot of doctors are like, they work for the insurance company. And but most doctors in the United States that take insurance, they have 3000 patients. Like, how can you take care of 3000 people very well? Like most accountants, lawyers, okay. you, you ask any business that has account managers, they can take care of maybe 70, 50 to 70 really well. They can manage 70 people, you know, or a hundred. And so concierge medicine gets to a couple hundred people. And I think if you ask any doctor, if they can take care of a couple hundred people, they can nail it. They can do a great job. 3000, forget it. Like everyone's getting yeah. shitty care and the doctor doesn't feel like he's adding or she or she's adding value and they get burned out. And, and, and that's what you see today is like this whole shit show. And so I'm trying to figure out how how to take the tools and the stuff that I've learned and fuse that into the broader base of medicine. And, you know, I was at the White House with Obama. I was invited in as the doctor of the future to a lot of these big insurance companies. They said, listen to this guy. You need to restart refactoring and returning the 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 dials on how you guys do things to map to outcomes. So I believe that your um, physician's income should be predicated on patient outcomes. Oh, right. So yes. I tell, I tell, I tell people in my practice that your good outcome is my good income and your bad outcome is my bad income as, as a concept. Um, and this is what's called value-based care. So, so the, the, I mean, without sounding like a weirdo, like the affordable care act, Obamacare, like, a, a, I mean, behind the scenes, a lot of it was predicated on conversations I had with a lot of people about how do we do it so that, like outcomes are the answer, not, not incomes. And yeah. if you have a transactional model where every time you see a doctor, somebody gets paid, that's the sicker you get, the more money they make. It's a transactional model. And, 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 it, and the there's incentives no outcomes. are screwy completely. Right. It's an incentives yeah. game. And it's it just, I, I think, and I hear this so often from, from doctors, from people who are, you know, patients in the insurance system in America or the healthcare system in America, it is so flawed because the incentives are flawed. I'm really interested because this idea of kind of concierge medicine and, and sort of bringing a, a sort of hospitality mindset in, what are the biggest learnings you've had? And maybe a question, how preventative do you take, how preventative is your approach versus kind of the more reactive traditional uh, response from doctors? Yeah, you know, we, we don't treat numbers, we treat people. And I think with all the data and all the stuff, so that's why you have to start with acknowledging that you're, each person is a, is a universe that, that needs to be kind of like, understood through various lenses. Um, and so it's like, what are, what are their goals? And it, there are some people that like, don't care about prevention. I mean, very few, but they exist. 
I'm going to live my life just the way I want to. I don't care about vaccines. I don't care about seatbelts. I don't care about helmets. Like, you know, you were talking about prevention. And so you, you have to understand, you have to meet people where they are. Like, first of all, like, and you, and you have to let them understand that I'm not judging. I am not here to judge. I am here to understand. And, you know, and I will, I will start to pass judgment on interventions of whether I think they're good or bad, but I'm not going to judge you for what you do or don't decide to do. I'm just going to tell you the risks and the benefits up to you. I will try to coach you into what I think is the, <laughs> a better outcome. Cause if mm -hmm. I come from your future, if I go to your future self, going back to this future concept, if I go to your future self, do you want dementia at age 60? You do, you don't care. Okay. So as you start losing your mind when you're 60, like I'm just going to remind you of this conversation now. You'll probably forget it because you're losing your mind, but like I won't. And, and you know, there it is. And so if you don't want to take your blood pressure medicines and you don't really want to check your blood pressure because you just doesn't hurt, doesn't bleed, doesn't cause you anxiety, you don't care about it. Okay. You're going to get dementia early, much sooner than you would have if you had low blood pressure. That's like a single most simple important factor yeah. for prevention like that a lot of people talk about. So so I try to understand these people, you know, all, all of all of our, our, we don't call them patients, by the way, we call them members. Um, and so the reason we call them members is because you're only a patient when you're sick. So if you come to the Apple store, I mean, the doctor store, without a problem, you, you're, you're an engaged member of your health and with me yeah. and we're, and we're trying to be preventative and there's nothing scary here. Um, so we, we do everything we can. So we have a, a group of doctors at our practice now and we're 28 doctors and, um, that we have an innovation council where we look at interventions, usually like not ready for prime time or getting ready for prime time to assess how they fit into, um, helping people navigate all this noise. Like again, there's all these celebrity podcasting PhDs that masquerade as like experts in medicine. But they're but they're quasi experts in science, and so how do people know what's what's true and what's not? So we try to like put some some element of a process and a diligence into because we don't we don't make money off of anything. We're, we have no financial incentive to seeing good science make its way to the foreground because that's just good for everybody. Because if you don't understand something like it, deeply and you you know you didn't you weren't able to ask a lot of questions like a, a dialogue about something. If I told the patient, you must do this and this is why, and they're like, well, I have a hundred questions about that, but you didn't give me time to answer them because we only had a 15 minute visit. Uh, trust goes down. If you don't yeah. give me the time and the space to let my universe and show you my, my stars and my black holes and my asteroids and my, you know, if you don't want to see those, then I don't necessarily want to see your, tr you know, your truth of the sun coming at me, yeah. you know, to, to keep the metaphor the same. So interesting. And w when you kind of, when you look in specifically with Innovation Council, obviously I'm coming from the, the early childhood yeah. intervention stance. And I'm interested because I know you're, a, I believe, a advisor on Eat Real. Uh, so I'm a co-founder. I founded that. Um, oh, wow. Oh, yes. I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that was a nonprofit, eatreal.org, um, which was trying to acknowledge, so you said earlier that all all things are chemicals and, and nature is like everything you look at can be looked at under a microscope and a mass spec until you, I'll tell you what the chemical composition is, but food, which is also chemicals can be processed and then it can be ultra processed and it can, you can add chemicals that aren't found in nature to it, or you can add chemicals found in nature and quantities that are like disgusting to it. So we looked at, or I, you know, going, going to this future concept again, if we look down the road, 30 years from now, and all these kids are in school eating like crap, sodas, chocolate milks, processed foods, they're going to have a level of inflammation in their bodies that's going to cause sleep problems, it's going to cause attention problems, it's going to cause cognitive problems, it's going to cause metabolic problems, they're all going to get diabetes, they're all going to like do poorly in school, they're all going to be overweight, and then they're not going to be able to get jobs. And then, you know, when, when, when we when you and I are old, and we need people to take care of us, there's an army of, 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 of incapacitated, handicapped people that are in their 40s, that just can't mm -hmm. really do this, you know? And so like, and I'm obviously being melodramatic here, but, but the truth is, is there, you know, 50% of the, of the U S population, I think in 10 years is going to be obese, you know, type of thing. So like it, it actually is coming. And so I, it's really hard to change 30 and 40 and 50 year olds, but you can change kids. You have to model good behavior. So 
if you want to change kids, you have to. So we, our thesis was, how do you change the menu of the largest fast food chain in the United States, which is our public school system, which is largely run by these conglomerates trying to like squeeze margins and go to farmers with like industrial grade crap and put it in our kids. And, you know, most kids get their lunch from school. So we Maybe. decided to like, let's bring a process that like helps parents, kids, superintendents, like how do we show them how to make better food? How do we show them what's in their food? So we created a, a certification process that looks at the, the health of the food, the health of the, um, like how far away were the vegetables sh shipped in? What, what is the impact on the animals the, and the planet? So it's, 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 it's the kids' um, transportation and, and, you know, is there hormones in the beef? Is there antibiotics in that chicken? And, we, and so if you want to go through our certification, we're going to remove all that crap and we're going to tell you where to buy from healthier places, which are usually smaller bespoke farms that cost more because they don't have the volume. So if you want to change the system, you have to change the supply chain. So our thesis was let's go to schools that are buyers. And so we're, we, you know, our goal is to change a billion dollars of purchasing power. You know, we already have like 2,500 schools. We have like 2000 on the waiting list. And the more schools we get, the more we can then shut shuttle their school money to better farms, more sustainable things, more local. And then we're getting celebrity chefs coming in to teach the kids how to cook and they get excited. So ultimately changing these kids and then they become interested in food and healthy food. Their whole generation has a chance. Because right now we are screwing. I mean, there's a book called The Ministry of the Future, which I may have mentioned in that book club, which talks about how there's no one no one here to speak for the kids that are both unborn and that are two right now. The constituency we should all be fighting for is our future generations. Like that's Completely. that's a no brainer. Like we, why would you not agree to that? So so that's the nonprofit. And it's you know, it's it's uh, our, we have this rock star woman as a CEO who has had a couple kids and she's really taking the the world by storm and, you know, kind of pushing everybody like, why tell me why we should be poisoning our children and adding chemicals to their, their bodies. Um, and, you know, it's hard to refute that. Yeah, that's amazing. So, so clearly food is one of the, the vectors. What are the other vectors do you think for, for parents specifically uh, and looking at sort of our future? So I think it's, I think it's three things. Uh, th uh, and one of them is probably broken down into two things. So food is one uh, socialization, um, with others and with family members, like going back to our parents holding their kids, are they being with them? Just the touch, that touch thing that I was talking about earlier, there's a magic in touch not to be dismissed. And then the other one, which is near and dear to you is sleep is, is how do you understand what's happening at night? Um, and obviously some kids, like I had one kid, my boy, like you throw him in the crib and he was out until, until I woke up like zero. The other one, I put them in bed and I tiptoe out of the room and they start crying as soon as I walked out. Like I have four kids and they, they all have like slightly different, you know, versions of, of, of sleep yeah. issues th throughout. And so trying to understand sleep architecture and sleep science is, I mean, we, we do it in adults now. Like I wear an aura ring and, and I think there's yeah. lots of, the, there's, there's, there's all sorts of mattresses, there's all sorts of data, there's all sorts of things to measure and to help parents um, help their kids. It also helps the parents. If parents, if the kid gets a good night's uh, sleep, the parent, the parent gets a good night's sleep. So you're, you're solving two problems at once. A, a cranky parent, by the way, you know, generally, you know, without a lot of sleep, may make rash decisions or yell or maybe more short than patient. And I think patience is like critical um, during Completely. the first five to seven years of someone's life. Um, so a, I think those a, are. The, those are the yeah, four just to say it's, it completely. I think it's such a it's a it's a vicious cycle often because also then you're you're more anxious if you're sleep deprived and if you're you're anxious there's sort of if they, they just impact everything. So my my kind of description is it's a contagious problem. One kid not yeah. sleeping, at least one caregiver's not sleeping, and then that there's contagion into the workplace in terms of retention, right. in terms of productivity, and so completely. It's one of these really interesting. Um, yeah, and I know that you're doing a lot of work on like what how to get you know sleep architecture yeah. and, and there's a lot of factors that go into it. And I think the science there is fascinating as it evolves. And, you know, I mean, I'm super excited to, to watch your company and, and how you're um, engaging in, in science because there's still a lot of anecdotes out in the world. Oh, it worked for me. I was just with a couple earlier today and one person said, I took glucosamine and I got better from my cold right away. And the other one said, and I didn't. I'm like, yeah, okay, that's, that's called an anecdote. Like, you know, that's yeah. not science, but I'm glad it worked yeah. for you. And so like really getting to like bigger numbers and putting some rigor around everything, I think benefits everybody. One more question before we go to rapid fire, mm. how much serendipity or what's your view on serendipity? So I think, I think serendipity is, um, 
is an openness to the universe. It's, 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 it's not having fixed ideas about things. I think it's believing that anything can happen. And then when you see it start to happen, you actually gravitate towards that thing. And then people call it serendipity. But it was like, and this is like intuition and we can get into quantum consciousness and autonoetic stuff. And there's like a whole other topic on that. But I think, I think you have to be kind of in the flow of things greater than yourself. And, and, you know, cause I mean, I, I, I think that like, I'm like the, all these things happen to me all the time. And people say, God, oh, you're so serendipitous. I'm like, I think it's, it's beyond serendipity at this point because it's like a pattern and it always happens. So it's, it's like, there's something I'm tuned into, um, or, or the way I, I'm a, trying to observe and understand things. So I, I, I believe that it's, it's all about perspective and, and, and where are you relative to everything else? And can you, can you like going back to that story about the guys at the fishing, like, can you look at the same thing from different angles in a short period of time and then position yourself to catch that serendipity as it goes by? Yeah. Um, Interesting. Without and trying to, like- without trying though, without trying, I think it's more of a, it just happens. Well, this is just, this is the interesting thing. I think there's always a tension between sort of uh, manifestation, so to speak, and which is consciously trying to bring something into fruition and actually just kind of letting go a little bit. And I'm I'm very interested, sort of. About I, well, that. I think there's I a tension in those two things. It. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Completely, exactly. Uh, yeah, no. Yeah, I, and I'm still grappling with it because for me, every time, um, like I, I'm sort of a believer in both, but for me, letting go typically leads to better results than trying yes. to force something. Yes, um, I agree. Who has influenced you most? So it's interesting. I, um, so I would say um, all the philosophers of the world, um, because I, I study a lot of philosophy, always have. Um, and, and, and those are generally mostly all male. I mean, except for uh, uh, Hannah Arendt and um, Simone de Beauvoir and uh, Sarah Sontag, uh, Sonia Sontag. Um, you know, there are, there are, but I would say it's, it's probably uh, my mom, uh, my wife, uh, that woman I met at the bar that sent me to Africa, um, the woman at the concierge desk that th- th- asked me to do something, you know, my daughters, y- you know. What is the, um, the book on your nightstand at the moment? Oh, what's this? What is this? It's called Wild Problems, A Guide to Decisions That Define Us by Russ Roberts. And what um, is the, the core kind of thesis of the book? It's, um, but it's about how that there are certain problems about in life that you can do matrices and scalars and like the pros and cons. And then there's some that you just can't and you need, you, and there are, there are people that, and I'm just starting it, but there are people like Darwin and all these famous people that like did something in their life. And then they reflect back on the, the wild decision about like who to marry, you know, versus should I get married? So a tame problem is, should I get married? A wild problem is who do I marry? You know, type of things. And so they go through, what a wild problem is and what a tame problem is and, and how do you, how do you better understand how you make the decisions that you make? Cause awesome. some, most of us do this automatically. Yeah. Very, very interesting. And then, okay. That that's current book, favorite book. This is a hard one. I know. Wow. You know, so, it was the, it was the unbearable lightness of being, um, by, uh, uh, I can't remember. I know name. exactly. I still haven't read it. It's been on my list for, for ages yeah, now. Yeah, I want to read it again. There was another book I read uh, called Jitterbug Perfume, which is also fantastic, you know, kind of fiction. Um, but I don't know. It may be Plato's Republic. Like, I read that in college, and I was just like, wow. Um, I sometimes go back and read that again. Just, just by how revolutionary it was to, like, have logic and think, you know, back then. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Okay. Fi- awesome. And then final question is, what is the one thing you wish you knew if you could say to your younger self, Jordan, this, is there anything, any wisdom you'd pass back? Know what your goals are, know what you're optimizing for in any situation, whether it's talking to a child or trying to get a job or like, know, know what your goals are and then try to understand what someone else is optimizing for. Because if you think they're optimizing for what you're optimizing for, you are in your own, you, you, you will, you will wind up disappointed. So you, you really have to spend the time to understand what is someone else optimizing for and try to like harmonize the thing you have to, you know, kind of a compromising what you really want 
by understanding what they really want and to see if you guys can meet in a, in a place to get you to like a, a, a happy place. And so, you know, and a, you know, a practical version of that is, you know, take your time in hiring people, but don't take your time in firing them. Fire fast. If someone's not working, it's because they're optimizing for something differently than you are and you can't fix it. It might not be fixable. And generally speaking, it's not like you've come up to, yeah. against a char character or logical issue. Um, yeah. Yeah. That's I, I fully agree. Jordan, thank you so much. This has been, as I knew it would be, just such a delightful conversation. Awesome. <laughs> I really do. I really I appreciate it. Love the way you think. I could I could go on so many tangents on all kinds of quantum entanglement discussions as we well, as we have we done previously. We didn't even get there. I we know. didn't even get there. My favorite subject. And I know. We'll have to save for another day. And I, actually, I might have a surprise for you on that that I'll um oh. I'll, I'll keep I'll keep quiet for now. But but hopefully okay. there'll there'll be a, like a very interesting conversation that you can have soon on on the topic. Wonderful. Um, so thank you so much. Um, and I hope you have a wonderful time in Tulum. Thank you.